If you've been listening to my show for a while, you know how I like to talk about a gut biome test. I call it a fancy poop test. It's a fancy name for a poop test. And it's going to tell us what the ecosystem is in your gut. And why that's important is since food's the best medicine, it's going to tell us, here are your superfoods just for you to eat. Here are the foods for you to avoid. And here's everything else. Eat this a lot. Eat this a little. Now, my team has been very busy and they got an amazing deal for anybody that wants to do this test. You can do it at home. You don't need a doctor's orders. All you have to do is just go to Viome, V as in Victor, I-O-M as in Mary, E.com biome.com. And at checkout, use the secret code, Julie Ryan, and you'll get more than 50% off. Don't put any spaces in there, just Julie Ryan. It's an amazing test. It's going to give you tons of information. I've done it several times myself, and you're going to be thrilled with the information you get because it'll give you a program just for you. Give it a whirl. Julie Ryan, noted psychic and medical intuitive, is ready to answer your personal questions, even those you never knew you could ask. For more than 25 years, as she developed and refined her intuitive skills, Julie used her knowledge as a successful inventor and businesswoman to help others. Now, she wants to help you to grow, heal, and get the answers you've been longing to hear. Do you have a question for someone who's transitioned? Do you have a medical issue? What about your pet's health or behavior? Perhaps you have a loved one who's close to death and you'd like to know what's happening. Are you on the path to fulfill your life's purpose? No matter where you are in the world, take a journey to the other side and ask Julie Ryan. Hi, everybody. I've got Daniel Mangena on the show this week. He's a successful entrepreneur who helps people reach their goals and their dreams by combining practical skills and energy. So we have a lot to talk about from the business side and from the energetic side. I have questions prepared for him to ask him about ancestral uh, conditioning and how do we break free from that? And what can we do when we're in the depths of despair about like how to pay the rent? You know, what are easy steps that everybody can do? And lots of other fun questions. So I hope you enjoy this talk. I'm really looking forward to it. Remember to like, to subscribe, to leave a comment and to share with your family and friends. So let's go talk to Daniel and see what he has to say. Daniel, I'm so excited to have you on. I, I have a whole bunch of questions for you, and uh, <laughs> we'll see where this conversation goes yes, with two, two crazy old entrepreneurs here chit-chatting. <laughs> so Indeed. welcome, welcome. Thanks Thank for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me, Julie. You bet. Let's just go ahead and get right into it. You have an impressive mission statement. For those of you listening that don't know what a mission statement is, most companies will have a mission statement of, we want to do this and this and this. And a lot of the time when you go into different offices, they'll have their mission statement posted on the wall. And your, yours is really extraordinary. So tell everybody what it is and how you came up with it. Oh, good Lord. You want me to re recite it word for word? I've got it here. I okay. can read it for to you. To spearhead an evolutionary uplift in human consciousness, awaking people to their unique role, often ignored, that I define as their dream. How far along am I? You're pretty good. You're pretty good. You're like, you're the last part of it was to awaken people to people the importance, to importance of, their, of their, unique their unique role. role. That's the one. And enabling them to manifest to their, their dream, dream life. life. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one. Which yeah. I thought. What a yeah. great mission statement. Because that's actually not the original one. That's actually the edited version. I, the original one was in my book, The Dreamer's Manifesto, that I wrote in 2018. And then um, when people that are actually much better at me than writing got to it, they, they, they made it a bit more succinct and clean. So I had to switch from my original one down to the edited one. But yeah, we, yeah, we, got, same, we got most of it. We got most of it. Same concept, though. Yeah. yeah. How, how did you come up with that? What? I mean, that's, that is one of the more profound mission statements I've ever oh, read. And oh, I've read a you. bunch of them. Oh, thank you. I think for me, what, what it really came down to was that I really see reality as a whole as this tapestry. And there's a story that once somebody told me, um, 
from the, the COVID times that really kind of really maybe it really gave me a real a real life example of exactly what I'm talking about with this mission statement. So Zadie and I was in New York and they were particularly strict in New York and you had to like set an appointment to go to the supermarket or something ridiculous like that. But anyway, the only time that she could get was some god awful hour of the morning, like five o'clock in the morning. And so she was going down her building and going to the store or whatever. And she said every single time that she went there, there was this one young lady that was at the counter that always was doled up. You could see that she was doled up behind her face mask and whatever the thing was. And she always had a high vibe energy, always was had like this great warming, loving energy. And she said, in the craziness that was happening, because you know, you know, New York was really, really crazy. That was this light that was shining for her. And it gave her something she was looking forward to. It brought a light into her life. And I wrote a, a blog probably about 10 years ago now, something crazy like that, called the, the the tale of the whistling garbage man. And and that was all about the idea that so many of us overlook things that we don't want to do that somebody else really loves to do. And when I look at this tapestry of reality that I mentioned before, there are so many of these threads that weave through that make the beautiful tapestry and every single one of them is relevant. The smallest thread can make the complete difference in the image. And all of those threads have a role to play. And sometimes I think we lose sight of how important our seemingly insignificant role is in the grand scheme of things. It was really just about having people understand that every single one of the threads that we are creates the tapestry as a whole. We're all important. We're all special. I agree. Well said. I, I take it a step further, Daniel, in that every experience that each one of us has is only going to happen one time. Mm. It's going to be us at that moment in time experiencing that from that perspective. And all that information goes into the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it goes in and it helps all of humanity because mm. our heads are like big satellite dishes and we receive and we transmit frequencies and we every thought has a frequency. So when we're thinking about something, we bring in that information kind of almost like on a two-way radio channel, mm -hmm. like you've tuned your satellite dish head to a TV station or a radio station. And all of those experiences from all of those people who've ever lived and who are currently living since the beginning of time are all in that information mm -hmm. that we have access to. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. I think it's if we don't know how to do something, most of us go to YouTube to mm -hmm. find out yeah. how to do something like how to, sure. I was on there recently trying to change my key fob battery in my car <laughs> remote. <laughs> I thought, how am I going to do this? I don't want to have to go. It, it was over a weekend. So the dealership was closed. Oh, wow. How, how am I going to do this? And so I just looked it up on YouTube and it was there. And, you and then I changed the it. It worked Good great. But, but I could have said, okay, spirit. How do mm -hmm. I change my key fob battery mm -hmm. in my car? Remote? The un universal YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And there's stuff you can find on the universal YouTube that isn't on the real YouTube yeah, exactly. yet. Exactly. So you're right. You say thoughts, energy, subconscious beliefs, and programs create our lives. Mm -hmm. Please explain what you mean by that. So my philosophy is that every single thing that shows up in our everyday life, our physical reality, is a result of movement that was or was not made through time and space. In other words, everything that happens in life is the effect of a causation of an inaction or action that we've made. But most of us are unaware of the fact that a big chunk of the causation that's leading to the effects is actually completely unconscious for us. I think the numbers are something like 90% of our everyday activity is completely unconscious. So we've got unconscious thinking, creating unconscious habits that's leading to our life. And then we've got our emotional state and the impact that has because we can only think to the level of our current emotional state. And anyone listening to that that disagrees, I invite you to try and think a happy thought if you're in a deep space of sadness or think a sad thought when you're in deep space of happiness. The emotional state limits what we can actually do mentally. And so when we start to understand this um, trickle-down effect of 
emotional state into unconscious thinking, into unconscious activity, into outcome, and start realizing that, hang on a minute, we actually have an impact that we can make on those unconscious thoughts. We actually can have an impact on what's going on with that, that emotional state. We can start to be a bit more intentional and create an outcome that actually, we actually want to see in our life on an everyday basis. Well, I think most of us have been in the car and we're driving someplace and we turn the wrong way because it's just the habit of how we yeah, usually exactly. go. Yeah, it's the unconscious, and yeah. I have done that. I did that last week and I wanted to head <laughs> south on a freeway and I was heading north, which is the direction I normally go. Oh, for heaven's sakes, girl. So I had to get off around. and turn, yeah, around turn around and come back. Yeah. So you're right. Mm -hmm. And that's just a quick example that most people can or, or you you are at the store and you think okay i'm going to do i'm going to buy this like the grocery store and i'm going to buy this this and this and you wanted to pick something else up but it wasn't in your normal route most of mm -hmm. us are habits i know when i'm in the grocery store i start at one end of the store mm -hmm. and i go and i snake my way through to get all this stuff that i need just because it's habit. I don't even think about it, mm, but it's mm, affecting mm. my outcome. And then I, I did that yesterday. And I thought, yeah. well, for heaven's sakes, I forgot to get whatever. And the reality of it was, it wasn't a part of the store that I usually don't go down. And so, and, and this aisle. is the whole thing about, you know, unconscious patternings and so many people beat themselves up. They get mad with themselves and they don't recognize that actually this beating down yourself is just reinforcing these same negative patterns. And a lot of people are completely unaware as well that as much as 70% of that unconscious patterning happened at a time in your life when you didn't know what was going on. The, the time that that really became really evident for me, my, my son's three, I think I mentioned before we started recording. So my son's turning three in December. And um, I'll never forget, he, he, he wasn't even one years old yet. He was about 10 and a half months old. I came back from the office, I walked through the door he looked at me, smiled, and he waved. And it sounds insignificant, but that's the first time that I've walked through the door and he waved. Now, this is the thing that I want everybody to understand. At no point did I say, Ethan, when somebody walks through the door, you smile and you wave. He just observed and learned the pattern that you wave in those circumstances. Today, I was video calling him and, uh, he was quite done with me and ready to go back to watch his cartoons. He said, I love you, Papa. Goodbye. <laughs> and then waved because he, you know, he knows how to end the conversation. But again, nobody said to him, this is what you do. He comes to a place of completion of <laughs> talking and he was ready to move on. But how many of us are dealing with patterns of behavior in our relationships, in our finances, in our health situation, where we have no recognition of where we learned to make that wave? How many of us are upset with someone or in a, uh, had a disagreement with someone today, but we don't know where they learned the hand wave of that behavior that led to that disagreement or that misunderstanding. So that really gave me a lot more compassion for people and their actions and also for myself because so much of what we're doing every day is just patterned on a time in our life when we, we literally had no, no fathoming or inkling of what we were patterning and learning to, to do and become. Well, and I think a lot of that comes from our ancestry too, and maybe we're not even aware, or maybe we mm -hmm. didn't even ever yeah, meet those epigen people. Is it epigenetics? Is it epigenetics where it's in the well, genes? no, it's just like ancestry thing. Mm -hmm. Epigenetics, I think of as just our surroundings. Mm -hmm. You know the, what what our environment is, but mm -hmm. but ancestors, and I I want to hit that in a couple of minutes. But first. You say we don't need to repro reprogram ourselves to live the life we desire. Mm -hmm. Why not? How do you do it if you don't reprogram yourself? So what I really mean by that is we don't have to wait for a full reprogramming in order to start moving towards life. Because I think so many people, they sit there, but oh, when I get to this place, like they're waiting for some space of perfection before they actually make a change. When actually you can start moving into things now. And although... Yes, we're going to keep reverting back to default until we've completely shaken the program. We can still start introducing things of our new into, from our new life now. We can still start taking actions that are associated with our new life now. You don't have to wait till you've got the reprogramming before you start trying to make, trying at least to make some healthy choices in terms of your relationships and your finances and your health. You can start doing it now and introducing more and more of it. And that will actually support you in breaking the program because there's a symbiotic relationship between what we're doing and what we're programming because everything that we do goes back and reinforces or disrupts the program. 
So when we just sit there in resignation or defeat against the program that we've been, oh, well, when that, when, when it changes, I'll change. Actually, we're just reinforcing it to stay the same. Whereas when we say, do you know what? I'm commanding something different in my life. Now I'm speaking life into my health. I'm speaking life into my finances. I'm speaking life into whatever. We actually then start to produce, um, to produce disruption that allows us to break those beliefs and those mental patternings in the first place and create space for something new to show up. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to give us some tips on how to do that, <laughs> we'll, we'll do in, that. A, in a little bit, but first, do the energy of money and success differ from the energy of love and wellness or other wishes and hopes and dreams? Does every, like, does money have its own energy? Does happiness have a different energy? Does, talk to me about the different energies of things, or is it all abundance and then there are subsections mm -hmm. in the big abundance umbrella. Does that so make sense? For, yeah, for me, abundance is all, all encompassing. And I think this is one of maybe I mean, I'm, I'm known on the money side. That's kind of where I'm known for. Right. Right. Um, but ultimately, the money was just a scorekeeper for everything else. Like I, I used the money as a, a means of measuring the capacity to actually be intentional in the abundance that was being manifested in all areas, because it's, it's you can measure it, you can track your progress and your ability. But ultimately, I think that they're all they're, they're all linked together. I don't believe that an abundant life has money without health, without love, without connection. Just the way that abundant life can't exist with just health and connection and no money, they all need to they all come together. What good is it to have all the love in the world and no resources to to deal with your everyday experiences or to fully express yourself in life? I think Wallace Steve Wattles in his book The Science of Getting Rich really kind of words that the best, where he's like, yeah, you could talk about just having the mind and the beauty of the mind, but what good is the beauty of the mind if you don't have the the means to put food in the belly, right? You, you'll die very quickly, right? And I don't remember the book that I read where it's, that, uh, there's a quote, it's easy to be philosophical on a full stomach. Like when you have those pieces locked down, you can start to take care of everything else. But I believe they're all together. Now, that being said, each of us are gonna have a different relationship to those different pieces. There'll be areas that will have challenges. I teach a principle that I call bleed theory, B-L-E-E-D, bleed theory, which is really this concept that ultimately everything's interconnected. And we can start to see clues and patterns as to what's going on in one area by seeing how we behave in another. Um, because ultimately it's the same brain shooting out different experiences on the same core blueprint although there'll be different offshoots depending on the context that we have around different things, the environmental lens that we're seeing things through, like I said, ancestry, um, cultural differences, but ultimately it's the same core code that's generating all of these different experiences. And again, for that new code that we're looking to create to be an abundant one, it includes everything. Interesting. I've talked before on this show about how as a medical intuitive and psychic medium that I can see the energy of money mm -hmm. that comes into people's homes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like a river that mm. flows down a street and then it comes into everybody's front door. Mm -hmm. Like if it's a home or mm -hmm. I can even see it in hallways and apartment oh, wow. buildings or condo buildings where there's this, you talk about the stream of money or the flow of money. Mm -hmm. And then I, I can watch it go into people's homes, which I don't do very often. I do it for myself, but I mm -hmm. do, don't do it because I think it's not of my darn business, <laughs> you know, how much money is coming into somebody's house. But I also can see the flow of money, the energy in my own home from a feng shui standpoint, mm -hmm. because I can scan a room and I can see like the financial line that mm -hmm. feng shui talks about from an energetic perspective and an assets line is different mm -hmm. from that. So I do think that they have different vibrations. I, I get that they're a fractal of abundance, if mm -hmm. you will. They're all part of the abundance umbrella, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with you on you want to have when when you're in the vibe of, of abundance, all those other different energies are there and mm -hmm. you're benefiting from them. Mm -hmm. When I talk to clients, either who call into my show or private clients, it, it's inevitable 
if they're having money problems or having relationship problems or having health problems or having, you know, all these other things. And the the inverse is true as well, oftentimes, Mm -hmm. you know, when somebody's healthy and happy and has wonderful relationships, the money thing isn't an issue. So I agree with you. I think it's all intertwined. Yeah. And I've seen it far too many times. So I've, I had a program. We don't run it separately now. It's part of Abundance University, which is our, our membership program, but it's called Micro to Millions. And people came for the money, but we saw family relationships repairing. We saw health problems that people have had for like decades. If this one woman had like 20 million different autoimmune diseases, went back to the doctors like, well, you've got no more diseases anymore. It's like, well, where did that come from? And 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 I believe it's just because we worked on healing as a whole. I mean, people what, what has to give them what they want so they want what you have to give. One of my first um, mentors taught me that line. And, and I said, you know, people came, oh, I want to be rich or I want to be financially free or whatever. It's like, okay, now that you're through the door, let's talk about you mastering actually your energy. Let's talk about you mastering your emotional state. Let's talk about you mastering the time that you spend consciously in your thoughts and setting up your environment to support you for the win so you can actually have habits that are going to lead to success. And when they started doing that, the health and relationships and stuff started to sharp and the money as well. I've lost count of the number of people that have asked me if they're going to win the lottery. <laughs> in the future. Am I going to win the lottery? How much am I going to win? I'll be like, mm-hmm. eh, I can give you what I'm getting today, but future events are <laughs> fluid and there are a bazillion variables that affect an outcome. So I can give you what that is today, but exactly. make your mortgage payment in the mm-hmm. meantime. Daniel, how did your young life set you up for this career path that you've chosen? Anything in your with your family or your childhood that kind of set you on this trajectory? I know there is. I just want to know what it is. Do you know the funny thing, Julie, is that I didn't really choose this. I actually ran away from doing this work. Um, I had very much a Jonah and the whale situation um, with this work that I do now, like really Jonah and the whale. For those who don't know the story, Jonah was sent somewhere. He ran away somewhere else and God sent a whale to swallow him and bring him back to where he was meant to be. But that's another story. But yeah, I I always knew that I was going to be rich. I knew that bit. Um, I, I knew I was going to be successful in some field or endeavor. And I made my first million when I was 19. Um, probably lost it because what's a 19-year-old doing having that much <laughs> without any experience and, and so on. But um, I I don't really feel that I was directly knowing that I was preparing for this life work that I do now. But looking back, I can see how all of the experiences I did have actually have empowered me to be better in the position that I am now. Certainly a lot of the humbling experiences were very supportive. Um, I was undiagnosed on the autistic spectrum until I was 27. That was a very challenging thing, but actually the resilience that I had to develop to operate in a mainstream world as a, neurotyp- a neurodiverse person really set me up again to be able to deal with different circumstances now later on in life. So I would say a, a lot of things set me up for what I was, I'm was i here, I'm, I'm doing now. I didn't come to do what I do now because something was missing. My life was actually working very well at last. By the time that this call came along, it's like, everything's working now. I don't, I don't want to mess anything up. Like, okay, I, I like my life. I'm going to keep it safe. And the universe divide is like, no, we've got something else for you to do. No, no, I want to keep this. <laughs> I want to stay in this very safe box. And I ended up getting dragged along. And, and it was really funny. I had a, a really profound meditation experience where I actually got almost like a, a, a vision. A vision seems like such a, a cheapening of the experience. It's almost like a three-dimensional, fully immersive, 3D virtual reality experience of what life was going to be like if I did answer the call. I was like, oh, that's what you were talking about. Okay, uh, I'm in. Uh, and that was the 13th of February, 2018. And I haven't looked back since then. I had a similar thing. A similar thing happened when one of my, well, my main spirit guide showed up when I was having an energetic healing done on me by my mentor. And he's this dead Pope named Clement the Sixth, And he showed up in his whole Pope outfit, you know, the hat and the vestments <laughs> and the whole nine yards. And he said, you're supposed to teach the world what happens when somebody dies. And I said, I'm not doing that. 
I'm a businesswoman. People are I'm nuts. I'm an inventor. I've got things to do. I'm not, I'm not doing that. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, get on with it. He treats me like I'm a Nike ad. Just do it. <laughs> and so here I am 10 years later, you know, mm-hmm. doing all this other stuff. And, and like you, and I think like most of us, we have our our life's path. We figure it out as we go and mm-hmm. it shows up in a way that we're, there's no way we can imagine it, mm-hmm. but we know that it's right. We resonate with it. And the more we fight it or the more that we say, well, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you know, good luck with that because <laughs> that's the way that life unfolds. Would exactly. you agree? Exactly. For the yeah. most part. And, and I'm not doing that. Maybe mm-hmm. exploring lack, Maybe mm-hmm. exploring poverty, maybe exploring lack of love, lack mm-hmm. of health, lack of whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's where we're being led. And mm-hmm. it's easier when we accept it and we lean into it or we take a step in that direction. And then all the people that we need show up right when we need them and all mm-hmm. the circumstances show up and and all of that. Would you agree? Yeah, I think a lot of the suffering that we experience comes from resistance. And when we drop that resistance and allow the flow to, to happen. I mean, I was, I was having this conversation, I was having this conversation just the other day. It's like, and I want the, the listener to actually, even if they pause this and go on Google and Google the spectrum of light and look for an image, go on the image, and it will show you how much of the full spectrum of light is actually the visible wavelength. It's like 2% of the spectrum of life is light is the visible wavelength. That means that of all of reality that's actually there that we can measure, that's not even going into what we can't measure, what we measure, 98% plus of it is completely outside of our conscious awareness. We don't have the means to interpret it with our natural um, five senses. So if that's the case, then how can I start to computate what's working, what's not working, if this is the right path or this is the wrong path? And we go from this limited perspective and we start to dictate whether something's going right and start to, I'm going to lock onto this. I'm going to hold on really tight to this. And life is flowing us another way. Oh no, I need to hold on to this thing. Not even understand it. There's so much happening outside of our awareness that could be taking us somewhere that we don't even know. Now, could the river be taking us somewhere disastrous? Yes, of course it could be. But we're holding on with this certainty that the thing that we're holding on to is actually the winning part when we've got no idea whether that's the case because we can't see all the moving pieces. And the suffering that comes from holding on to this and resisting that could be completely alleviated by, instead of opening up to this playful curiosity about what might be there, and then perhaps course correcting as we have more data following the flow of what is, rather than fighting what is and wondering why we're exhausted all the time. Well, and that's when the serendipitous things happen, Mm -hmm. where the people we need are there and Mm -hmm. and the circumstances are there. Yeah. And all of that. And, Agreed. and miraculous things yeah. can happen that you're 100%. just thinking, how mm-hmm. does that happen? I have a quick story. When I was, I think I was 29, I sued a $30 billion company for a breach of contract. Mm-hmm. And I was living in LA at the time. And my lawyer said, well, I've got, we, we're going to need an economist. And I use a professor at the University of, of Southern California that I used and he told me his name. And I said, wow, I went to high school with a guy with that name. It was kind of a rare name. (laughs) And back then we didn't have cell phones yet. I had a mobile phone, but it was hardwired into my car. Yeah. This was, this was in the like uh, late eighties. My my dad, my dad had one in his car as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. (laughs) Yeah. And so I, uh, especially in LA with the traffic, yeah. you know, it's great. It's great. I'm running late. I'm stuck on the whatever yeah. freeway. So I called this professor and I said, are you the Mark Zupan that, grad- that graduated from Bishop Waterson High School in Columbus, Ohio? And he calls me back and goes, are you the Julie Ryan that was in my class? And I said, yeah. Well, this guy, my lawsuit was in Boston. This guy had graduated from Harvard with his undergrad and his master's and then got his PhD at MIT, mm-hmm. homeboy, right? With all those schools, right? Being right there in Boston. And we won the case and he helped and all that. How does that happen? I hadn't thought of him, let alone talk to him <laughs> in over 10 years, had no idea where he went or what he was doing. That's an example of an orchestration. Mm-hmm. When I was in the flow and following what I was supposed to be doing, 
where here comes somebody and, and it was so much fun strategizing with him because I already had a frame of reference because I went to high school with him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The energy you was make, there. You can't make that up. You can't How does make it, it work? Up. Yeah. And I think, I think if anyone wants to doubt the flow of synchronicities and how that can happen, look when everything that could go wrong did go wrong <laughs> because it's the same flow of potential, but it's just been channeled into a disempowering course of events instead of an empowering course of events. And if we actually just take the fact that that course of events ran out, we can then extrapolate, well, if it can go that way, it must be able to go that way. And so we can start to open up to the possibility that maybe things can start to conspire in our favor and move in that in that back-to-back, -back, you know, uh, snowball um, effect in our favor instead. Well, and also that the stuff that feels negative is benefiting us in some way, even yeah. if we can't see it at that moment. Back to that story, mm -hmm. breach of contract, what did that lead me to do? That led me to start a company to compete with the product mm -hmm. that was in question, broke their patents, signed with the number one global company in the world, beat them at their own game before mm -hmm. I was in 30. Wow. So that was a situation where, was it fun to do a lawsuit? I thought it was fun because it was interesting from a strategic standpoint. <laughs> I think someone but likes the was, blood. Someone likes the blood. Someone likes the blood well, at least. <laughs> well, but it was, I think the company was just so amazed that I had the audacity. You know, I was young. I was female and I even have blonde hair. But I'm like, guys, mm -hmm. you're playing with the wrong girl here. Mm -hmm. And so then what did that do? That allowed me to look at it in a different way, mm -hmm. create something out of that situation. Mm -hmm. And then it I had a I had royalty income for 20 years mm -hmm. off of that. So it was something negative that we can create out of. I always say you need to know which you don't want in order to create which you do want. Indeed. Indeed. And I and I think that's with anything. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have that contrast, we wouldn't know what we wanted to create. Mm -hmm. Mm, 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 would mm. you agree yeah 100% and I think when we um, when we start looking at events in our life more dispassionately I think the story was from um, A New Earth I think Eckhart Tolle's book A New Earth when he tells the story of this monk so the, the monk lives in this village and uh, one everyone reveres this monk oh you Mr. Monk oh we revere and then uh, one day the girl winds up pregnant in the village her parents come to his door knock 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 our daughter said that you got her pregnant he said is that so he said, yeah 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 and everyone's like oh you got the girl pregnant oh, and vilifying oh mr monk you dirty scoundrel and then the baby's born they're like well you're going to look after this baby because at the end of the day you got her knocked up so he's your responsibility now he says, is that so he takes the baby oh look at him you know duh. and it sometime later turns out it was like the butcher's son or something like that that really got the, the young lady knocked up not Mr. Monk. So everyone comes, oh, Mr. Monk, we're sorry. The truth's come out now. It wasn't you. Oh, I believed you all the time, Mr. Monk. Of course I didn't. But um, he just says, is that so? They said, well, you know, it's not your baby. So we're going to take the baby back now because the parents actually want the baby. So he says, is that so? Anyway, at every single one of these points, he didn't allow his emotional state to get swayed by what showed up. He just said, is that so? Now, I'm not inviting, I'm not demanding, should I say, that all of us have that monk-like approach to everything that happens in our life. But there's a lesson that we can learn from that because this thing twisted and turned, right? It twisted and turned a million ways. And we, again, going back to this point that we were discussing before about, you know, surrendering versus holding on or resisting. When you move with the flow, you can actually gather sufficient data to make more empowered decisions. I'm not saying that we just bob along and do nothing. But if we stop holding on and start moving through and say, okay, what's the new data that's here now? Oh, this is the new data that's here now. What can I do with that? Oh, I can make this decision. Oh, oh, I, I now, oh, I know this person from, from school. Okay, we can, we can talk and discuss. Maybe this is a sign that this is the right person for me. Okay, move on. But when we start doing that, we can just be so much more intentional, so much more directive and so much more present to our experiences rather than being this, you know, this pinball that's been knocked about by life, which so many people are doing. It's a really disempowering way to live, and it's not the way that you have to live at all. I agree. What is it about a person's own energy block or negative mindset about anything, whether mm -hmm. that be money, love, happiness, whatever, mm -hmm. that hinders them? And we all have it. No, what, yeah, what is it? I, I mean... Going back to the, 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 the through flow that I mentioned before, 
our reality comes from our habits, actions, and behaviors. Habits, actions, behaviors are coming from our mind. Our mind's coming from our emotional state, right? And so we could extrapolate from that that we can, we're, we're limited to what we're going to experience, to what's going on inside of us, right? And so if we are trapped in a particular pattern of thought, a pattern of emotional state, a pattern of environment that's supporting these thoughts and emotional state, then we're not going to be able to advance into anything else. We're only going to be stuck experiencing things that match that. And so when somebody, again, is not being intentional, they're just sort of bobbing along. Maybe they've got some blame going on, a little victim story and whatnot. Then they're not actually stepping into a place where they can do anything different. So the same pattern of environment is going to experience, be experienced, supporting the same emotions, the same thinking, the same habits, the same behaviors, the same experience. Anybody that wants to break into a new experience is going to have to start looking at these pieces and you don't even have to upgrade them all at once. And this is, you know, one of the things that I found in the work that I've been doing over the last few years is if we focus at just at the top, okay, let's look at the environment. Let's look at the emotions that the environment is triggering and asking yourself, would you cognitively connect to the emotions that you're being triggered by in your environment with the outcome that you want? And if not, what changes can you make? What upgrades can you make? What shifts can you make? What healing can you do? What growth can you do? What learning can you do? What, um, what, what new thinking can you start to introduce? What new conversations can you be having? And it, on, the th on the thinking, it's even the, the, the talk that you're having with yourself. There's some people I know that don't have anybody around them. What about the conversations that you're having with yourself? You're there most of the time anyway. Are you asking expansive, empowering, forward-moving questions? Are you asking yourself, why am I always so stupid? Oh, how could I do that again? Instead of, wow, what could I do today to expand my mind and how I feel about myself? Hey, what are some ways that I can come up with to do this differently? Or I'm interested to see in, a, in what way I can maybe start to shift out of this habit of behavior. Just these curious, open-ended, forward-thinking conversations that we have with ourselves and others are going to shift that, switching up the environment. Because we are so, anyone who doesn't believe that, pick your, fun, your, your most favorite comedian and play one of their stand-up sets and see if you can stop yourself laughing. You can't because the environment triggers that in you. Put the saddest movie that you can think of and you're not going to be able to stop the tears because the environment's going to trigger that emotion, which is going to get you into the thinking, get you into the action. So start getting intentional about that environment. Start getting intentional about the emotions that you want to experience in your end result and start cultivating an environment that supports that giving yourself different conversations inside and then tracking those habits and you'll find a new life shows up. Well, to your point, from an energetic standpoint, anything that feels bad is based in fear. 100% mm -hmm. of the time, anger, jealousy, boredom, grief, whatever, it's always based in fear. And we, I find that when we're in fear, we're in fight or flight. The body mm -hmm. doesn't know any differently between what's a real fear and what's a fake fear. Yeah, of course. We can't get guidance mm. coming in energetically when we're in fear because spirit doesn't communicate on the I feel crappy channels. The vibration's <laughs> too low. Change the channel, so guys. To, change the channel. <laughs> change the channel to what you were talking about. Exactly. And so what I teach is go to the grocery store and walk the aisles and smile at somebody. Smile mm -hmm. at everybody you see, even if it's forced. Mm -hmm. Your brain's going to follow it. You're going to have changed the channel. Mm -hmm. Ask the question, what do we need to do to blah, mm -hmm. X, Y, Z? You know, mm -hmm. how can I learn more about ABC? Exactly. And the information's going to be able to flow. But when mm -hmm. we're in fight or flight, when we're in fear... We lose perspective, we lose clarity, and we're disconnected. Mm -hmm. And and all we can think of, our body, all our, our body can think of is, how do I run away from this fear? Well, the fear is, I'm not going to be able to pay the rent. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know that you can run away from that. <laughs> but I think you're not going to get a solution while you're stuck in that fear. You got to change the channel. Mm -hmm. Is there a simple way that you can share with us, Daniel, about how to break that cycle that mm -hmm. everybody can utilize right now? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the simplest, simplest, simplest thing I always say to people is you need to remember that the environment is going to trigger the emotions, whether you're conscious of it or not. No matter what you think you're trying to do, what you're, you're, you're telling yourself you're moving towards, the environment that you're in is going to be setting off that snowball effect to the end goal. 
And so we need to start really sitting with our environment. Just go through the, the people that you spend the most time with, the places that you spend the most time, uh, the things that you're spending the, the most time doing and ask yourself, how do I feel when I'm doing those things? How do I feel? Because what that's doing is it's giving you an indication of what's happening at the energetic level, because the energetic level we experience first, first with how we're feeling. So when you start to link the consciously how I'm feeling with what I want as a result, you're going to start to get a, a feed into what's going on with those energetics. And you're going to start allowing more of that positive energy through that's going to support you in changing your thinking, support you in changing your habits. And you don't have to change everything in, in one go. It might just be that day one is just becoming aware. Oh, wow. I feel really crappy when I talk with that person, but we've been best friends for 25 years. I'm not telling you to end that, <laughs> that friendship now, but at least be aware of it. Maybe you're going to start by just maybe prepping yourself or shifting the dynamic. I, I was speaking to someone this, about this the other day. I said to him, well, this is one of your oldest friends. He says, yeah, I don't know what to do. I said, well, why don't you find something positive and empowering that you guys have in common that the time that you do spend together you can actually spend time focusing on that rather than allowing the, the conversations and the time spent to mindlessly drag you somewhere that's going to bring you down your spiral and knock you off into, uh, energetically. Find something positive. And now even those challenging relationships, you can start to shift the energy around and start to create space for something new whilst you work on perhaps healing your you know, trauma bonds or whatever it is that's, that's got you linked up in these, these relationships that, that are holding you down. But certainly becoming aware of what, how I feel in different environments and starting to create a cognitive connection between those feelings and understanding that those feelings are an indication of what's happening on the energetics. And that's what's going to lead to what we're going to experience in the physical realm because the physical realm is the manifestation of the blueprint that's happening at the energetic level. But we build out that blueprint through our feelings, through our thoughts, and through our actions, much the way that a blueprint doesn't turn from a, a piece of paper magically into a house. You have to dig the foundation, you've got to go and get the bricks, you've got to you know, do the, the, the painting and, and do the tiling and all of the things. But that process is still playing out what started as a blueprint. Without a blueprint, you can't build. And when we understand that ultimately we're dealing with the divine intelligence is the most perfect <laughs> contractor. You're never going to get them skipping on the job. They're going to give you an exact build out of what's happening in that blueprint. But we need to understand that we are supporting that with what we're thinking, what we're feeling and what we're doing. But unless we know what's in that blueprint, which again, just starts with awareness of where we're at on a regular basis, then we're not going to get anywhere. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And so, succinct and concise and actionable. <laughs> I love it. Well, right. and we're we're going into the fourth quarter of the year. Mm -hmm. We're going into the holidays. Mm -hmm. And to expand on what you just talked about with a friend, many people go through the holidays mm -hmm. either miserable because they're with family that they don't necessarily <laughs> want to be with. And somebody has got some, you know, crazy uncle who's going to yeah. be there that makes everybody uncomfortable and or they're by themselves mm -hmm. and they, it, it's really a tough time for mm -hmm. them. Or it may be that they had some bad memories during the holidays and they surface back up. Mm -hmm. Can you expand that a little further and give us some ideas of, of for people who are facing that and and they're thinking, okay, I got three months to prepare for the holidays. How am I going to do this? So here's the thing, and people aren't necessarily going to like what I have to say. Ultimately, you have to decide what do you want more? Do you want to be at peace? And in an energetic state that allows you to create a more abundant, joyful, purpose-driven life? Or are you actually addicted to the narratives that are being played out with what you're in? And I think if a lot of people really had an honest look at themselves, and I've caught myself doing this many, many times, actually you're addicted to the story. Now, again, I'm very much about what I call micro-shifting, not trying to do everything in one go, but just asking yourself, what am I able to do today without resistance? And it might be that today all you can do is accept, that, oh, wow, yeah, I've got a bit of a victim story. And I don't necessarily have to have those conversations. I can have a, a firm conversation with that uncle and say, hey, you know, I'm not really interested in, in having these conversations with you. I love you, but, you know, this can't continue. We don't want to do that because our identity is tied up in the victim story that we're playing out through those narratives. 
And so I would say, you know, if you want something a bit different, just ask yourself, am I prepared to let go of the identity that's tied up in some of these experiences? Oh, you know, g- going back to, to work in January, oh, I had to deal with my, my stepmom or my mother-in-law or blah, 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 or whatever the thing is and, or whatever the story is that someone's got. Or are you going to say to yourself, oh, you know, this, maybe this is going to be the year that I'm actually going to have those difficult conversations. I'm going to put myself first. I'm going to love myself enough to break free, fr- break free from these habits and these identity driven narratives and do something different. Even if, if it means this year, I'm going to be by myself, but I'm going to be myself in a healthy energy field. <laughs> doing something yummy versus throwing myself into toxicity and then complaining about it later. Well, and we, uh, our thoughts create our reality and we're the only ones that control what our thoughts are. Mm -hmm. So somebody can act like just a goofball and Mm -hmm. be on our last nerve Mm -hmm. and we can look at them like they're a clown from the circus with purple hair and that's a role that they're playing. Yeah. So I think we can we can do that as well mm-hmm. in that si- situation. But I, I hear that a lot mm-hmm. during the holidays. Oh, yeah. my gosh, I have to go yeah. be with whomever. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that this is easy at all. I'm not. I'm not saying that it's easy. But nothing of value ever came easily, right? <laughs> I heard somebody one time, and I think this applies to Daniel, I heard somebody say, well, you know, when you're sitting in poop, you know how it smells, you know how it feels, it's yours, you're yeah. familiar with it, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, and it's scarier to move into yeah, and sitting in a different situation than something that's that's already familiar. And, and do you know the thing, Julie? My whole thing is this. If you're happy in the poo, Acknowledge, come into a conscious realization that you're happy in the poo and then quit complaining about it. Just be in the poo. (laughs) But maybe you didn't realize that you were unconsciously happy in the poo and you're ready for something, something new. And then the game begins. But until you recognize that you're in the poo and that nobody's forcing you to be in the poo, actually, it's just you and the poo and you could stand up and get out of the poo, then you're always going to be in the poo. Right. Mm. Well, and wouldn't you agree that most people aren't cognizant of oh, any of this? Most people it's are not. just habitual. Yeah. Again, going back to what we're saying earlier, 70% of our unconscious programs happen between the age of zero and seven years old. And those same programs are playing out 90% of the time at the unconscious level. Right. So we're playing out these narratives. We're playing out these core wounds. We're playing out these hand waves that we learned when we were 10 months old not even aware of where it came from or even that we're doing it. And then we have a victim story about how people respond to it, right? Or we're creating victim stories for others by how we're pressing them in their situations. But if we start to come into that, con- that conscious relationship, we can start to explore it and play the game of sort of treasure hunting. Oh, wow. That, oh, how interesting. Okay. Do I want to keep that thing? I'm not really ready to face that thing right now. Okay, well, I'm going to put that over there and I'll come back to that later while I deal with this one over here. Okay, I'm ready to go and deal with this one now. I'm ready to do some healing with that. I'm ready to have that conversation. But there's a forward momentum, a forward movement happening that's supporting us on our journey forward. Tell us about that because I think most of us believe that we have to have a roadmap where mm-hmm. it's all figured out. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're going to do this and then that's going to lead to that and that's going to mm-hmm. lead to that and that's going to lead to that. Whereas what I always suggest is take a step. You're going to be led to the next step. It's like mm-hmm. being on the yellow brick road in the Wizard mm-hmm. of Oz. Mm-hmm. You're going to step on a brick. You may lead, you may land in a field of puppies mm-hmm. and take a nap and it's wonderful. You may land, a brick may land you in a haunted ca- castle being chased by flying yeah. monkeys and it's yeah. really scary. Both of them are benefiting you because even the one in the castle, no, you're led to look to the right and oh, there's a pail of water there and you're mm-hmm. led to throw the pail of water, you know, on the Wicked Witch and the Wicked mm-hmm. Witch melts and then you're mm-hmm. back on the yellow brick road. So it's all benefiting us. But mm-hmm. h- how do you coach people in that you don't have to have the whole roadmap mm-hmm. put together? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, as well as I do, no company in the be- since the beginning of time has ever followed a business plan because no. life happens. Well, the business plan is for, for the, the bankers who don't, who aren't actually business, the people. Bankers. <laughs> not exactly. business people. Exactly. Right. It's for the bankers and the investors, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And and nobody ever follows one. I mm-hmm. mean, we have an idea, but you yeah. don't follow it because life happens. Yeah. So how do you coach people into 
taking individual steps. I know you talk about five slices of the pizza. Tell <laughs> us about that. And, so, and how, you know, how can people do that and, and get off of, oh my gosh, I'd have to know what the whole plan is, which gives them a false sense of security. And, and that's what I was going to come to. I think what, what people are trying to do is they're trying to create security. And the sad fact is that people don't realize that in nature, security doesn't exist. Safety doesn't exist right. in nature. But we've created this construct where we believe that we've got safety and security when we don't. And so we, we, we're fighting this, we're fighting for this thing that we're never going to have, locking ourselves in these boxes, committing to journeys that we're never actually going to be on. Like you said, the business plan of life that we think we're going to step, follow step by step and then get into these disempowering emotional states and thinking patterns. Oh, I didn't follow all of the steps on my business plan of life. You were never going to follow the steps because that's not how life works. So what I tend to do is basically just disrupt the underlying false narrative that it's ever going to be safe or it's ever going to be certain or it's ever going to go according to plan. So if that's the case, why are you going to waste all of this energy trying to force something to happen when you could be so much more joyful and curious and playful following the steps of what happens and taking the next step and then taking it and preparing yourself? What lessons can I learn from this one? How can I grow? What's there more for me? Okay. How can I, um, Maybe I'll see a couple of potential things in front of me. Oh, okay. Well, there's a few potential things going on there. Can I resource myself to deal with those? Okay, I can. Oh, I can't prepare for that one. Okay. Well, can I get some support? I can't get some support. Okay. We're going to see what happens and, and, and see what's on the other side of it. And that's when life becomes more of a fun game rather than this torturous experience of trying to force things to give you a safety that's never actually going to happen anyway. Oh, I agree a hundred percent. Think how boring life would be if we knew what the outcome was always <laughs> going to be and how we were going to get there. I, I saw then, an, an analogy of a movie. Like, would you ever go to a movie if you knew exactly how it's going to end every time no. and exactly what everyone's going to say? You go to be entertained yeah. by seeing the journey right. of how it turns out and how it rolls out. Not, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen and this is what all the lines are or whatever. Well, or even if you know what's going to happen, when, mm -hmm. if you're focused on the end result, nobody would ever get on a roller coaster exactly. ride. Exactly. Ever, ever. Because mm -hmm. you know you're going to end up a mm -hmm. certain place and get off the ride, but you don't know what it's going to feel like when all you're the going, twists and turns, you know, yeah. twists and turns and yeah. stuff like that. All of that. Yeah. Tell us about your different, you have a bunch of programs that mm -hmm. sound amazing mm -hmm. to help people follow their dreams. Mm -hmm. Go through what some of your more, more popular programs are and mm -hmm. what people can expect mm -hmm. if they decide to enroll in your programs. Well, thank you. Well, pretty much everything now is in Abundance University. So um, a little while ago, I decided I really, really want to focus on, on the serving side of things. I'm really blessed in that I have entrepreneurial interests outside of this work. You know, I, I'm, I'm not dependent on selling a course in order to, to, you know, to pay the bills or whatever like that. And so I, I really just wanted to find a space where there's an energy exchange, which is reasonable and also honors the energy that I've poured into creating these things without me needing to necessarily be hands-on. And so all bar, we've got one offering that's not really a part of that ecosystem, but pretty much everything's in there. My micro to millions program, which is a blueprint from zero to 1.6 million and beyond, and you can do it in as little as 12 months. It's a really fun game that talks about these principles we spoke about today, how we use intentionality, group intentionality, focusing and aligning your energy, emotional resilience, um, mindset shortcuts, and also something I call Money DNA to find your natural flow with money. So that's a really, really cool program that we've got in there. Um, my Beyond Intention ecosystem, which is the first framework that I built, and it's the topic of my book, Stepping Beyond Intention, which is a four-step model on, on how to break stuck states, um, disrupt disempowering patterns, and to create more of an empowered movement forward intentionally. So there's a few programs around that. Um, some stuff on money DNA is in there. But yeah, generally speaking, it's intentionality being directed to what we're choosing, what we're feeling, how we're behaving, so that we can really start to consciously create and curate a life that we really want to live. Uh, and most of my work is going to be supporting people in doing that. Two questions along those lines. Are those skill sets that somebody that enrolls in your courses, are they transferable to children? 100%. To help children 100%. go through something maybe with them yeah. at the same time, but 100%. you know, make it understandable for a yeah. 
small child. I, I like everything step by step and I like everything really digestible. Um, I don't believe that fluff is necessary. Fluff is great for marketing material, but in terms of transformation, it's not required. And so um, everything is really designed so that really anyone can pick it up, execute on it in a, a very short, uh, very short space of time. And it's something that can be replicated without that much, um, you don't need a PhD to get this stuff. Let me put it that way. It's simple because simple works. And again, I didn't come to do this work because I, I, I was in corporate and I felt empty and my soul was calling me. I was actually living you know, a very happy life and I, I got pulled to do this. And it's real life experiences that have been translated into these programs and offerings not just mine now, but you know, over the last six years now, also other people's life experience has been built into those as well. And now we've got countless people around the world who've been living this stuff and showing that this stuff actually works to actually be able to, to execute and create a life that you want. Well, and what I brought up at the beginning when we first started chatting was the generational mindsets mm -hmm. that are there. Do you find when people are able to move past some of these blocks, I'm using that, you mm -hmm. know, in air quotes there, mm -hmm. some of these blocks, that it really helps stop the generational mindset that's kind of a program that's running under the surface that they're not even aware of. And uh, do you find that, that, that it's multi-generational yeah, a think, lot of the I time? Think, uh, so much patterns on and, and again, you know, so great to be able to have a conversation with someone that understands and is open to talk about the energetic side of things because everything that's physical has got a metaphysical counterpart, right? And so DNA has got spiritual DNA that runs alongside it because the one can't exist without the blueprint before. And so when we start to hear what's going on, on the energetic side, it allows shifts to happen in the physical side because they're mirroring each other. And so when someone comes and starts to do work on themselves, then when they pass their genes on, they pass the genes on with that new energetic blueprint to go and come inside with their physical blueprint. It's like my, um, I keep talking about Ethan, but because he's just been such a teacher for me, but like he's, it's so funny watching him do stuff that I, I did when I was his age. I don't do it now. But it's like, it's like, wow, he does like this little face thing. I was like, wow, like my mum's like, he used to do that all, all of the time. And it's because like that experience I've passed on to him energetically through the DNA. The DNA was the, the, the carrier for that to get to him. So also all of the healing that I've done and continue to do is going to be transmitted through energetically through and also the physical example that I'm going to be embodying now with those heel changes is going to be supporting in what he sees an example as he goes through too. So you've got the physical, you've got the mental in terms of the, the mental programs that we're transmitting through how we talk and what we talk about with the, those that, that come after us. You've got the energetics that's happening with the healing that we're doing and also physically with what we're actually physically doing and what people are learning. Again, those hand waves, I didn't teach him how to, to, wave, his, to wave his hand. He saw it. But then there was also the energy encoding of being open to learning. And there's also the mental encoding of be polite, right? All of those pieces came together with that. And we can start to do that with how we're passing um, all of our story on to the generations that are to come. I agree a hundred percent. And we can, when we heal ourselves energetically, it goes both ways. It goes to our future generations, our to. children, even if they're already alive, mm -hmm. doesn't have to be somebody that hasn't been born yet. And it goes in the past too. I had a gal on my show named Nina Mongendre, who does energetic healing that's ancestral in nature. And mm. she talks about how when we heal what's going on in our lives that has been passed down, perhaps through multi-generations, that it goes back and it helps heal those ancestors mm -hmm. that have been dead for mm -hmm. a long time, yeah. but it helps heal them as well. Mm -hmm. Case in point about the DNA thing, my husband, Tim, gosh, I guess we'd been married pretty early in our marriage, maybe three years or so. And he picked me up from the airport one night. He said, I need to talk to you. That's usually not a good thing. <laughs> you know, when he starts off with, I need to talk to you about something. I'm like, okay, what's up? Well, it turns out he had a son that he didn't know about. And oh, his wow. name's Randy. 
and the son was, he's eight years younger than I am. So he was born when I was in the third grade. He was afraid I was going to be mad at him. I said, why would I be mad at you when I was in the third grade when you were doing the wild thing? I don't, you know, I didn't even know you yet. So anyways, they met and their mannerisms, Daniel, are identical. Wow. They're Facial expressions are identical. Their bald spot in the top of their head <laughs> is identical. Their hands look the same. They laugh the same. They didn't meet until Randy was 40. Wow. Now you tell me, how does that work? Hmm. How does that work? It's the DNA. I'm it's saying. the behavioral stuff. It's what you were talking about, how your mom said that you're you know, your son's making facial expressions that yeah. you made. Well, he's around you. Randy had never been around town. <laughs> that tells you how strong that it genetic does, thing is. It does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So case in point. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you bet. I have a question I'm going to ask you that I always ask everybody when they're on my show. And that is, why do you think we incarnate? Why do we incarnate? Hmm. So... I've been toying with this a lot recently. Uh, I was introduced to the book um, Destiny of Souls by Michael Newton. Newton? 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 Um, and it was fascinating because this guy has literally interviewed all of these different people under hypnosis who didn't know each other, and they've all got this entire universe that he's discovered by having these conversations and performing these interviews and regressions that matches up and the pieces are all coming together by people who didn't know each other, right? And so I find the evidence a little difficult for me to throw away that there is something going on in that regard, that there is a level of experience that we do incarnate from. Um, my firm belief is that there are some things that we're never going to know until we do pop our clogs and return back, right? <laughs> And pop our clogs. Pop our clogs. Is yeah. that what you said? Yeah, pop our clogs. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> East London. <laughs> we pop our clogs. That's, that's East a good London one. for you. So yeah, and and so, but my thing is, how much of that is relevant to what I am here doing now? So let's assume that we did incarnate with a reason. Are we going to find that reason? in ongoing research into where we came from, or are we going to find that reason playfully exploring where we could go? Uh, so for me, I define desire as the heart speaking to us what the divine seeks to express through us. And time and time again, I've never failed to see one of those heartfelt expressions not guiding someone at least to the next step on that journey that we were talking about earlier. And so... When people ask me what purpose is, I, I believe that purpose is something that's reborn every every moment. I personally have been through various iterations of what I knew I was called to do and thought I was going to be doing it forever. I had no idea I was going to be doing this this right now. I was very sure what I was doing before was what I was supposed to do. I'm very sure what I was supposed to be doing before. And I've had some very, very clear-cut light from the sky, bells and whistles, signs that I was supposed to be doing that thing. And yet, it can change. And as we move through this, weaving quantum overlay of different reality timelines and so on and so forth, a chance encounter could pop us onto a different timeline or a choice pops us to a different timeline when a past, uh, a previously assumed purpose and destination no longer is aligned with what we've expanded into now. And so for me, the game is what does the divine seek to express through me today? And how can I do so fully, presently and lovingly? And that's what I believe that we incarnate to do. I agree. Well said. I I get that we incarnate to create, mm -hmm. which goes along with what you just mentioned, and also to to live a life of joy, mm. to find joy in mm. everything that we do, even mm. in the tough times. Yeah. You know, it's benefiting us in some way. Where's 100%. the joy? Mm -hmm. Where's it going? Let me circle back for one one last question sure. for you. And that is I I've read that you had a spiritual experience and you mm -hmm. alluded to it earlier. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that and yeah. how it, what kind of an effect it had on your life? Sure. So I, I started my personal development journey in my teens. I was reading books like Think and Grow Rich at 16 years old. 
um, I, I wholeheartedly attribute my early successes to the fact that I was reading books like Psycho Cybernetics and Joe Carbo's Easy Way to Riches and Stuart Goldsmith's Midas Method and all these kind of things, the, the Charles F. Harnell Master Key System. I was doing that as a teenager and, and, and use those to create. But it was all very mental, very much that masculine pushing mental energy, focus, get it done energy. And then having gone through my whole journey, um, around the time, about 10 years ago, maybe, yeah, about 10 years ago, I started to really tap more into the feminine. And this isn't about gender. This is literally the polarity point, like the feminine energy side of it. And so whereas all of my metaphysical studies and practices before had been very much from the very masculine, esoteric, now it started to come into a very spiritual kind of flowing. And I started to find that balance between the two. And as I was going through that journey, um, I ended up spending more time in more quote unquote spiritual communities. And as I was doing that, more and more people were, just, it's almost like the universe was not like, hey, we've got something for you to do here. I was like, no, like I said, my life was finally working <laughs> by this time. I didn't want to get in, mixed up with anyone. I didn't want to, you know, I, a very, very working life. And yet the, the calls started getting louder and louder and louder. And I remember sitting down one day and saying, okay, let's do a deal. And I was trying to like negotiate with spirit. Like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So this is what I'm putting on the table. This is what I'm offering. I'm going to offer you this, this, and this. And like, I laugh at myself now having those conversations. So, you know, it's like, oh yeah, of course, that's exactly what's going to happen. Look what we're going to do now. And so, um, so I had a load of deals on the table and I said to myself, spirit, I said, oh, look, okay, when these deals go through, right, I'm going to have my nice little nest egg and then I'll, I'll happily be a poor teacher, wink, wink, right? You know? Well, I'll, I'll give up everything once I've got this certainty, right? This safety, the illusion of safety and certainty. And what was really funny, Julie, is that seven and a half million dollars of booked revenue, not like hypothetical, booked revenue disappeared over the course of four days that I was at a meditation retreat. And I'm talking like one of them was with a Hong Kong company that had a member of the party on the board, they lost their foreign exchange license. So they had to pull out of the deal and couldn't do the deal. Right. And like this person just disappeared. And I mean, you could get hold of them. It was completely random things. Whilst I'm at a meditation retreat, I'm in an R ing and up my chakras and, and all the things I get back and everything's collapsed. But the funny thing was, is that because I'd been in that space for a few days, I heard that little voice that said, are you going to trust us now? You don't need to work out how this is going to work out. We've got you. And so I started with, I was kind of was in that place of sort of trusting. This ha what happened about October. So I was in this place of sort of, sort of trusting. And then um, again, 13th of February, 2018, I'm at another meditation retreat. Hadn't had the best experience. There was some distractions that week. But anyway, the, the event's finished. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go and do a walking meditation before I go home. Because, you know, I'm just gonna, I've got my flight in the afternoon. I'm going to go do, do my walking meditation, get the taxi, go to the airport. So six o'clock in the morning, February, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe, New Mexico in February, for those who are unfamiliar with the weather, at six o'clock in the morning was not Mexico. It was Santa Fe, <laughs> New Mexico. It was very, very cold. So I had like multiple layers. I had hot pockets shoved in my gloves and in my socks. I had long johns, thermal vest, earmuffs, hat, like, but I'm off still doing this walking meditation in the morning and poof, it hit me in the middle of this walking meditation. I got future paced into exactly what my life would look like if I stopped resisting and just went with the flow. Because again, my life worked, right? I had some money in the bank, things were working out. You know, I had a great relationship with my friends and family. It was working out, da, 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 traveling, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, you're shortchanging yourself. And I literally walked off of that. Before I'd even got to the airport, I'd shut down my website. <laughs> I'd sent emails saying, sorry, uh, have your money back. Or sorry, I'm not gonna be able to finish your contract for you. And I just walked away from everything. And within a couple of months, I packed up everything to a backpack, a suitcase and a suit carrier. And I was traveling around the world sharing the work that I get to do now. Wow. 
Yeah, that's what I would call a colossal spiritual experience. <laughs> Jeez. And you followed through on it as well. And I, like you, have argued with the spirit. <laughs> yeah, like, ah, yeah, yeah. Can we negotiate oh, the terms happening. on this one? Yeah. You know, they just, they just look at us and they laugh. They go, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah, yeah. Good, good luck good with that. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. exactly. How can people learn more about you? Dreamwithdan.com. Easiest place to find me. Dreamwithdan.com. What a great website name, <laughs> dreamwithdan.com. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you for taking the time to join us thank this week. Me, He's Julie. in Dubai, everybody, so <laughs> it's time for you to go to bed. <laughs> and, uh, and sending you lots of love from and Sweet you. Home, Alabama, Mwah! and from Dubai, from Daniel as well. So thanks for joining us, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.